Welcome once again to the official MUFON podcast. I'm your host, Richard Beckwith. What happens when a UFO crashes? Does it lay on the ground in the middle of nowhere like a meteorite until someone stumbles on it? Or is there a secret government organization whose primary function is to track these objects down and retrieve them when they come down? Then turn them over to private industry for study, analysis, and back engineering. A clandestine cabal whose equally nefarious mission is to keep a lid on the entire subject, going to great lengths, even murder, to keep the real secret. Well, Ryan Wood grew up in Southern California where he became first exposed to UFOs when his father, Dr. Robert M. Wood, was engaged in deciphering the physics of UFOs while managing a research project on anti-gravity for McDonnell Douglas. In 1978, he graduated from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo with degrees in mathematics and computer science and has had a long career in marketing, sales, engineering, and corporate management across many fields, including semiconductors, computer systems, medical imaging, energy conservation, aerospace, and now in fusion as the CEO of Electric Fusion Systems Incorporated. Ryan is regarded as a leading authority on the top secret classified Majestic 12 intelligence documents and the 1941 Cape Girardeau, Missouri UFO crash. A frequent lecturer on UFOs, Ryan has taught college courses and made numerous presentations about UFOs to civic organizations and at ufology conferences around the world. He has organized seven worldwide UFO crash retrieval symposia, each with conference proceedings and presentations from UFO crash investigators, along with keynote banquet speakers. He once presented a UFO lecture to an international class of military officers for a national security affairs class at the Naval Postgraduate School that formed the basis of the final exam. He manages the content of MajesticDocuments.com and, along with his father, was the executive producer of a television documentary that aired on the Sci-Fi Channel detailing the authenticity of Majestic 12 documents called The Secret. He has been interviewed on numerous television shows such as the History Channel, ABC News, and numerous local Bay Area, Denver, and Las Vegas TV channels. He has been a radio guest with Art Bell, Jeff Renz, and George Norrie several times. I am very proud to have him with me here tonight on the official MUFON podcast. Ryan Wood, welcome to the show. Thanks, uh, Richard. It's great to be here, and I'm excited to share the the wisdom that i can with uh, the mufon audience and everyone else i appreciate that ryan you're perfectly suited to our audience because you're going to talk about things that our audience is extremely interested in which is mj12 it, before we get started you are going to be speaking at the symposium this summer in dallas and so can you tell us first of all just a little bit about what your talk is going to be about you don't have to do the whole talk for us but yeah, no, um, we'll cover the, 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 I guess I'm going to start with my perception of where we're at. What I consider is to be, you know, almost certain understanding of the ufological field. And then what I call the probable understandings of, um, and then uh, speculative ones and Everybody sort of has their different opinions, you know, where, where do you put an abduction, for example, is that almost certain or is that speculative? Um, everybody has their own sort of metric, but I'll try to flush it out with details and, uh, and make it crisp. So I'm going to start with that, and then we'll get into some of the data associated with uh, UFO crashes uh, and my new book, Magic Eyes Only. Um, the original book published in 2005 uh, has been updated in 2024, and the original one had 74 UFO crash retrievals, and this has 104, and I left a few on my desk because I wanted to just get the book done. Um, so it's copiously footnoted and referenced and uh, authenticity ratings for every case and I try to do a good job of pulling together the other experts in the field. I'm not an expert in Roswell, for example. I may be in, in um, Cape Girardeau, 41 crash, 
But there are many other people that have spent a lot of time investigating a particular crash, and I try to bring in their stories and expertise into the book uh, so that people can read anywhere from one page in a simple summary to uh, 10 pages in a more complex case that's been well investigated. <clears throat> that's something that uh, we've really been interested in is uh, the recovery of materials from crashed alien spacecraft. And I'm assuming that there will be some discussion about what's happened lately with uh, David Grush and uh, his testimony before Congress and uh, the comments that he made about uh, things like knowing that we recovered biologics, as he called them, uh, and that sort of thing. Yeah, good good, uh, good reminder. Yeah, Grush is uh, 1933 cat crash case is new to this one. And we'll certainly talk about Rush. Uh, I feel, you know, validated or vindicated um, that, you know, from 2003 to 2009, I ran seven UFO crash retrieval conferences in Las Vegas that are as big as the MUFON conferences. We had 500 people from around the world. Many MUFON people came. So it was um, it was a fun time, but we were clearly way ahead of our time now that Grush has come forward and testified before Congress that there's a complete validity to the notion of, of crashed ET craft, despite the fact that he seems to be thrown under the bus, uh, you know, yesterday or the day before with the latest announcement from uh, uh, the disinformation people at the Department of Defense. Yeah, the Aero program. I'm right. really, I'm really kind of happy that we didn't get involved in that. It appears to me to be a, a repeat, essentially, of the uh, Blue Book report, <laughs> and, oh. in that they just, uh, you know, and and I, I think it's going to be difficult for people to resolve the testimony that Grush made before Congress under oath. How how do they? Uh, square that against, you know, what these folks are saying in Arrow's report, especially in light of the ICIG's re report that Grush's claims were credible and urgent. So I, I don't know how you square those two things. It, it appears to me to just be sort of a feeble attempt to whitewash yeah, I mean, the whole thing. I, I think it's as bad or worse than the crash test dummies of, of Roswell uh, <laughs> long ago by yeah. Richard Doty, you know, um, I agree. Now, yeah. and I think this, from my experience in this for uh, quite a while, is that where where all this sort of started to unravel was after the uh, release. I don't want to say necessarily the release because the videos were still out were out there, but the authentication of the Tic Tac uh, and Gimbal videos and Go Fast videos, and so. <clears throat> and I was actually with your dad when we uh, when we uh, got to talk to Lou Elizondo about that. And so my my question is, is that how you perceive it? That the sort of the I guess the things sort of began to unravel around that time. Oh well, I think it's a contributing factor. I mean, it really unraveled when Grush came forward, uh, and, and that he became the whistleblower. I think back to the Belgium case uh, in in the late 90s or early 90s, where you got front page news pictures of a flying saucer, flying triangle in Belgium, and they interviewed the Air Force pilots that were chasing it. And it was, um, you know, very stunningly authentic and very well reported in Europe, but less so in the U.S., Yes, uh, incredible uh, sighting. I think they had, uh, I think, didn't Colonel de Brouwer from the Belgian Air Force come and, and testify, I think, at uh, Dr. Greer's disclosure conference. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, yeah, you, you would think that after a while, well, at least some of us have sort of gotten the idea that, well, maybe there's something going on. But I think that's for the for purposes of just keeping it down. You know, just sort of, I, I, if you'll forgive the term, I kind of call it peeing in the pool. You know, if, if you're in a pool of nice, clear blue water and someone, you know, pees in the pool, what, what kind of water are you swimming in? Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the nature of disinformation. And uh, so we'll talk about Grush at the uh, MUFON conference a little bit. Most people have heard that and followed that. Yeah. Um, 
I'm yeah. also going to uh, launch into the uh, the AI ufologist, which is a, a, a new book that I uh, created. Really, it came out of the work that I was doing in my day job as the CEO of Electric Fusion Systems, where we've been using um, AI to mine insights into oh, 100 different scientific peer-reviewed papers about uh, nuclear fusion. And I, you know, for a whim, I said, well, why don't I just take a bunch of books and papers that I have on my server and um, use the same process of, uh, of training the AI and embedding knowledge. And it, it's far more complicated than just simply attaching a PDF to uh, chat GPT. Um, and then I asked it a question. I said, you know, what's the alien agenda? Uh, sort of classic, classic question. And the response was so quick, so thorough, and, and relatively exciting <laughs> that I decided, well, well, let me ask it another question. Well, why do they abduct people? You know, wh wh what's their mission? Well, why, why is MJ-12 here? Uh, you know, how do you reconcile the government's mission with the transparency right of the people. And you're going to um, tell us all this at the symposium, right? Yeah, right. Well, I'll have the book there. I mean, it's, it's, and it's, uh, we'll, we'll go through several examples and I'll probably pull some examples live from the audience and do some live responses. Um, and that's the thing that's so stunning. I mean, most like the alien agenda, most people get the fact that they're scientific analysis. So they're looking at, uh, the evolution of earth or they're doing genetic research and uh and the spiritual uplifting but you know they they miss the six or seven other things that um are very real possibilities too but you know multiple races have multiple missions and different agendas and you know it's all speculation as to what they're here but people want to know that it reminds me of the the early days of stanton friedman when he used to ask the ufo why questions um, you know, why are they here? What do they want? Right. Like well, that. I think about uh, Michio Keku's uh, analogy of uh, super advanced aliens flying down the highway and we're just a pile of ants on the side of the highway. And why would they even be interested in us? But I also look at it in a different way in that, you know, as humans, uh, when we pass ants on the highway, normally we don't care about it, but there are people that we call entomologists, and all they do is study ants, and they even have specialists who study nothing but particular species of ants. And so certainly, despite how advanced they may be, they I cannot see why they would not have an interest in us on some level. Yeah, I mean, it's a great analogy, Richard. Um and, and the anthropological, uh, let's study this emerging kindergarten planet and see whether the night it blows itself up or not. Um, we have, we've seen 50 other planets like this and uh, across the multiple galaxies. And while well, they all have souls too, you know, so while we have to pay more attention to them, they're not just simply biological disposable droids the way maybe some of the ETs are. Um, yeah, like so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated with that aspect of ufology because I I remember and and I'm sure that perhaps part of your uh, inclination or, uh, about that comes uh, from what Bob Lazar ran across when he was sub, uh, looking at the written materials that he was exposed to, where it talked about uh, the aliens referring to us as containers, and they were and and what we contain are our human souls, and, and so the question is, do they? Do they lack souls or, or you know, and, and is it is is having a soul not necessarily uh, a requirement for being a, a living sentient being? Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, we, I don't think modern science understands the soul or where it is. Um I think it's biological, but I, I I'm just speculating. So, I mean, there's. There's be a lot of fun with the AI ufologist, uh, I think. Well, and then the other thing that I'm going to focus on is is really a call to action. Um, 
you know, my impression, although I've been out of ufology for the past dozen years, uh, so to speak, with kids and family life, et cetera, um, is that we're lacking leadership, we're lacking uh, money, we're lacking motivation. People uh, aren't willing to go do a bunch of work um, to solve the problem. Uh, and particularly, there's lots of volunteers that do things, but they can only do so much without being adequately funded to, you know, you, you take a crash retrieval case, for example, sort of one in the sort of neutral bag um, where the, you, if you push at it, you could probably make it more authentic or less authentic. Uh, but it's a certain date and time in a certain town. And you, you need to go there. You need to interview witnesses. You need to camp out for a week. You probably have to go back two or three times. You got airplane tickets. You got to go to the National Archives to do historical aerial photography research. You, this just, it can go in so many different directions. Um, so, so that And that is why old men like me chase ufos because we have nothing better to do and and uh you know i'm getting close to retirement so <laughs> that's that's what yeah. old men do they they yeah. chase ufos and, and bigfoot uh but but yeah. my interest is in the same thing that you're interested in which which is you know ufos and i agree with you we're not no one's really adequately funded i mean there are a few individuals who are fortunate enough to have access to really good equipment and so forth uh you know smaller smaller groups but your average um, ufo field investigator how would they be able to handle an actual crash and retrieval if there was uh, something like right. that to happen within their within their area it would be very it would be impossible for them to deal with uh, on a competent uh, in a competent manner because they simply lack the expertise necessary to, well, most of them would lack the expertise necessary to uh, properly process evidence gathered from a site like that. So I, I agree with you. I think that, and and not only that, but, but I think we're also lacking in, uh, you know, researchers who are willing to to sit down and read through the documents and do as you and your father have done with MJ-12 related documents. And yeah. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that if if we can. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, I want to add one thought to your discussion there about crash retrievals. At one of the uh, UFO crash retrieval symposium, I think it was 2006, I had an airplane uh, archaeologist come airplane crash. He, he basically did stealth fighters and ox card and, you know, exotic experimental aircraft crash sites. And um, the military invariably comes and cleans it all up. They do the best they can. Um, but he, he came on stage and said, well, I went to the Bakersfield stealth uh, 117 crash that happened. Uh, I forgot when it was. It was in the, in the 90s or early 2000s. Um, and I, I found all these parts, and he just brought them up on stage and showed them off. Uh, and it reminded me in the audience that no matter how well they, quote, clean up a crash, there's still evidence out there. Um, but, you know, it takes people, metal detectors, ground penetrating radar, aerial photography, where did it really happen? I mean, it takes real work. Yeah. Um, well, and let me let me say too, Ryan, that I think that uh, part of that may have to do with with uh, what has crashed. So oh, yeah. I, I would suspect that uh, that relative to what you're saying, that when it comes to an alien spacecraft, they may go out a couple, three, four, or five extra times than they would if if a, a, a jet like that landed and they wanted to, you know, crashed and they wanted to make sure that uh, uh, you know all the pieces were picked. Yeah. Up. Well, I mean, people, somebody found something from Roswell just the other day. Yeah, I know. They, they keep finding things. They're really yeah. unusual things. I, I found the the uh, so-called Roswell rock to be fascinating. Right, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, and I know that there were some other materials picked up there. It's like some strange, almost kind of melted plastics and things like that that really couldn't be explained. I know, and, and they do continue to pick up things at the site. Right. Or I, I'm reminded of Linda Walton Howe's business magnesium piece of Roswell um, crash, allegedly. But, you know, she's done some typical scientific analysis on it. But where's the people, the scientists that wants to do 
sputtering of bismuth and magnesium back and forth and do a full scientific properties workup and find out what the diamagnetic properties are and, you know, do a serious peer-reviewed scientific paper on that. I, I would budget at least a half a million dollars to, to go at that. Yeah, the, um, the only people I'm aware that are doing anything close to that is Dr. Nolan and, and uh, the folks at at uh, Stanford. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I think that he gets, you know, outside funding, not from Stanford University to do that kind of research. I think he's able to do that. But he's the only one I'm aware that has done that in-depth kind of work. And I think he's more fascinated with uh, the biological aspect of of. Uh, of craft and it's currently but be could be a hybrid biological material craft I, well uh, that's that you know that's come up in in some of my discussions i was having a discussion with kevin day on on uh, facebook the other day and uh, the sub the subject came up of um, conscious craft or artificially intelligent craft and <clears throat> i've had some experience with individuals who felt that the craft itself was conscious. And I was discussing the difference between consciousness and artificial intelligence. In, in the particular instance I'm talking about, an individual uh, was involved in a crash and retrieval sin, uh, in a, a incident. And this person was allowed to go down into the crater that this thing had created and he told me that he touched it and ran his hand across it. He said it was the most beautiful thing that he'd ever seen in his whole life. But he said, and it had, it was not damaged in the crash, but he said that when he put his hand on it, he immediately got this message in his head that said, uh, uh, you're not supposed to be here. <laughs> like, the, like it was talking to him, you know, but, yeah. but without, but using, you know, some sort of, you know, dare I say telepathy, but this is coming from what we would consider to be an inanimate crashed craft of some sort, but this thing was communicating with him. And yeah, so well, you've probably uh, heard it makes, that. Makes sense. And, you know, if you want to explore the cosmos, it, it might be better to have a biological uh, tool that could self-replicate or repair, things like that, rather than a mechanical uh, device that could fail permanently. I mean, this. You're talking about you're talking about uh, that Star Trek episode Tin Man. Remember that one? <laughs> Vaguely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's a, a biological spacecraft that you know right. w cared for its crew essentially and was m many millions of years old. And I I suspect that that's kind of possible in your in your studies of these craft. Have you run across anything like that? Something that you know where the mm -hmm. the folks that retrieved the craft. Uh, found it to be uh, more unusual than one would expect out of a simply physical craft. Like I've heard stories about craft being larger on the inside than they are on the outside. Yeah, that's certainly been reported uh, on multiple cases. But no, not specifically about the biology. Most of the um, the scenario is is it it gets identified, tracked on radar, or, or observed, or somehow crashes. And a few witnesses see it, or there's some sort of leak. The military sweeps it all up and takes it all away, and and you're left with not much to investigate. Um, but sometimes you get official documents like moon dust documents um, that support crash events or uh, retrievals, or some of the leaked majestic documents certainly support um, all, all sorts of crashes. And that, that's wow. consistent with, uh, there was a story recently in the uh, Daily Express, which essentially exposed a program wherein the CIA has an ongoing program to retrieve crashed UFOs and then turn them over to private industry. And that sort of fits within that whole, uh, you know, modus operandi relative to the military and intelligence and what they do with these things. And, and starting back with Colonel Corso. Right. Or, or earlier in the advanced study group uh, of uh, Zimmerman and um, General Exxon um, uh, in, in 1946, 47. And it's, um, I don't think they give intact craft to uh, anybody. I, I think that it's still pretty compartmentalized. 
you know, if you look at the special operations manual, extraterrestrial entities, technology recovery and disposal. Psalm, 101, this whole, Psalm 101, right? Psalm 101, yeah. Psalm 101. And, um, and power plants go to Area 51 S4 and clothing and, and other types of uh, uh, navigational stuff goes to Wright-Patterson Air Force Place Blue Lab and and I would think the compartmentalization and would still be well in place such that um, nobody gets the full picture when it comes to the people that are doing reverse engineering, um, like Aerospace Corporation or Bechtel or um, EG&G e &G. or uh, <laughs> all, all the usual suspects of uh, – you know, Lockheed Martin, Skunk Works, and, and they may be compartmentalized programs even inside those organizations. I don't think the the board of directors or the CEOs of those corporations, I think eg and G is now the Carlisle Group, um, no, have a clue what, what's what's really going on underneath the hood in their classified programs. So Let's talk about Psalm 101 for a second, because that is part of a, an overall collection of documents that mm -hmm. uh, you and your father have both extensively researched. And uh, before I before we talk about that, I, I'd like you to address um, the FBI uh, investigation uh, around the Majestic 12 documents, wherein they allegedly, well, they didn't, they, they said that they were all all debunked and there was nothing to it. I think that you feel differently about it. I think I feel differently about it. And so my my question is, what do you say to those folks that that say, well, the the whole thing is just ridiculous. None of the none of the all of those documents that were produced are are all hoaxed, uh, and there's just absolutely nothing to it. What what do you say to those folks? Well, um, just to build on the context before I ask, answer the question for you, sure. There's some thirty five hundred pages of leaked. Majestic documents um, spanning 20 years or so from 1984 to early 2000s from seven different sources um, all across the country, of which the Special Operations Manual is, is one source via through Don Berliner. And we can talk more about that. So the first thing is, is that there's lots of different sources, lots of different uh, documents. Some are original uh documents such as the uh, Bowen manuscript, which is uh, is in the Encyclopedia of Flying Saucers now, which has been reprinted and is available on Amazon. That That's new. This hasn't been out there for five or six years now. And, uh, and it's also on Kindle, too. Um, I put it all up. Uh, the other thing is that I believe the FBI looked at only the Eisenhower briefing document um, and said it was bogus. Um, and the way they determined it was, quote, bogus, was they took it around to a variety of different intelligence agencies and said, did you lose this? Did you... <laughs> you <laughs> like know, they're going to like they're gonna say, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, hey, thanks. <laughs> it's ours, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and so... They may have said, well, yeah, it is ours, but we want you to tell everybody it's, it's bullshit and uh, and move on. So the answer is the FBI. I welcome the FBI. If the FBI ever wants to really investigate, oh, I'm all in. And uh, I could lead them, you know, give me three FBI agents and three months and we'd knock the socks off of it. Um, <laughs> but of course, that was not the purpose of the investigation. The purpose exactly. of the investigation was to quell public interest in the subject and do much as the Arrow Report did and, and uh, just throw uh, cold water on the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, so, uh, but then, you know, circling back around to, did, did that Psalm give enough context? Yeah. Let's talk about Psalm 101. And, yeah. uh, and, and first of all, tell us about... Uh, the process that you used uh, to authenticate Psalm 101, and uh, and what you okay. think it was ultimately, what what the purpose of it ultimately was, uh, and your interpretation of Psalm 101. Yeah. So um, 
I'll start with what the FBI would start with, which is the provenance of where it came from. So it was mailed to Don Berliner in 1994 as undeveloped Triax film, of which Don developed it along with my father and printed off big 8x10 glossies of every single page, and then they began to retype it and study it. Um, but it was mailed from La Crosse, Wisconsin. And um, this was about a right around the time of the um, Oshkosh fly-in air show. Um, and the speculation in my mind is that somebody flew into Oshkosh and mailed it off from the Quillen Pharmacy um, in, in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, but now a little more of the Providence detail is that on the inside cover of the the manual the leak manual is a stamp that says um unit kb88 building 21 uh kirkland uh afb n dot mex mex period um so first of all the abbreviation for 1954 is correct for new mexico because it didn't have a two-digit uh n at NM. Uh, if it really said NM on it, oh, that would have been a big flag to be fake. Uh, but it didn't. And then it uh, says Kirkland Air Force Base um, at Building 21. And so I went to the facilities manager and we looked it up. And sure enough, there was a Building 21. There's a little cinder block building on, on, the, uh, on the base. So all that checks. Um, and then you go to the uh, change control page, which is the next page, which is where the officers um, say, well, we updated page 23 um, with a new page. Um, this is a top secret controlled document. It's probably only a few copies available. It may have been a, a binder that was taken to each crash retrieval site as a, a briefing document for soldiers or the recovery teams. But in there, there was uh, two uh, initials, uh, JRT and EWL. And so I went to the Albuquerque phone book and found, <laughs> um, sure enough, oh, wow, there is a JRT, Jess R. Totten, and EWL um, in the phone book. And why, Joe, they both live on Perimeter Road on Kirkland Air Force Base. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and it, one, one says Lieutenant Colonel, and the other says Captain, I think. So that's the Providence story. Uh, you know, uh, I'm in 99.9x percent confident that that's the real deal. Um, Why would so this is uh, someone on the inside, um, perhaps you know one of these two individuals that wanted someone to have this document. Right, or one of the people who was briefed or had it, that, and he took pictures of it, uh, you know, it, relatively hastily in my mind, given the way the fingers are on the pages and the way, it, you know, it was a it was an echo binder type, um, wasn't three-hole punch. It was six by nine. Um, With the metal strips, right? Yeah, the metal strips. So it it was taken that way. And then... Then you go into, well, what does it say? And what what can we learn about that? And so it's a how-to manual, how to, how to go to a crash site, how to pick up the debris, how to create a cover story, tell the public it's a down satellite, tell the public that it's a, a fire or, or, you know, make up a story. They give a few examples. Do they say something like, it doesn't matter how outrageous it is, just make it up? <laughs> In short, yes. <laughs> that's that's absolutely correct. I knew the answer to that question. I just wanted to hear so, you say it. <laughs> um, and then it, it, it's more practical in ways. It's, it has descriptions of type 1 uh, extraterrestrial biological energy or EB uh, or EBIN. Uh, and then type two, the type two is the typical sort of gray that we've all heard about. And the type one is more of a, a 
a little taller, more oriental uh, or, or Chinese-like. Um, but there's detailed descriptions of, of those uh, in the, as well as, you know, how to pack it up, ship it off, uh, the, the, the supporting tabs with photographs and all sorts of additional information were not supplied. Um, there's things like the entomology of it all or the, the word choice and fingerprinting, uh, the fact that it uses first aid um, as uh, I think two words and capitalized when in more modern times it's a single word or or screwdriver um, is same thing the same thing it's it's two words in the manual and one word in in modern world um, and then there's the um, the interview we did with the government printing office. Um, this is clearly a typeset. So this is 1994. This is before like word processors. Uh, Everything was on a printing press with little letters yeah, that had to manually place. Um, you know, Cork Express, which is the precursor to InDesign nowadays, um, it, it's just a dream in, in some software engineer's mind. Uh, but we took it to the printing office. We actually took it to Robert McCarter, who actually is a recently retired, um, at the time, uh, government printing office employee. He wrote the uh, style manual uh -huh. for the uh, government printing office, the government style manual um, for a couple of years and edited it. You know, you would think that the style manual is a little tiny thing. But no, it's like a serious textbook with all sorts of rules on formatting and indentation and styles and fonts and just, it's amazing. Um, so we, we handed it to him, didn't tell him anything. We were sitting at a card table in his house um, and uh, we said, well, what do you think of this? And and he looked at it and he said, "Well, from the title, I think it's a fake." Um, but then he started flipping through it and said, "Oh wow, the Z's are slightly raised off the line. Um, it's an artifact of the hot lead printing press." And said, "Oh well, that's an that's a zinger for authenticity. And furthermore, I think it was printed by the CIA down here off Tenth Street." At one of their classified cages, um, and you know, so he added a little more color to. Wow. Color. Well, that so that that brings me to my next question, which would be, uh, Rick Doty. <laughs> so, what what involvement, if any, do you do you think Rick Doty may have had in in some of this? Because I think, I think uh, at least. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, there was some effort made to sort of throw investigators into this whole thing off track. Well, I'm I'm just speculating. I don't have any firsthand knowledge. My impression is that Rick Doty was just another disinformation guy. He was probably, you know, told enough. To, we, this is national security. It's real important. We got to hide all this stuff. You go make up stories and. Do your do your work with the Roswell crash test dummies, and, and do what you can do to. Uh, we'll help you as much as we can, but you know this is your mission, and um, I've I've ignored him. Um, he's still alive, I think, and still mucking about occasionally, I guess. Yeah, I think he's still uh, in, involved in it to some extent. It sounds like uh, you know he's sort of. Uh, turned around and said, "Well, this is what I did," and uh, and and he admits to being involved in all that. But it, it also, uh, you know, sort of takes away from what he's saying now because you have to wonder if if the things that he's saying now are simply or merely a continuation of the misinformation that he was producing, you know, back when when these things were really hot and taking place. Um, uh, during the process that you've used to authenticate, now you, you're talking about, we're not just talking about Psalm 101, we're talking about, you know, as you said, uh, hundreds of pages of documents. And, yeah, yeah. And, and in all of those documents that you have uh, carefully looked at, how many of them, or have any of them turned out to be 
what you would determine to be false or that you were able to say this is clearly fabricated? Um, none. Uh, now, I will say there's clearly dead ends um, in that the document doesn't have enough information. I think of the Aquarius documents that uh, mention Carter, I think, um, where there's nothing to verify, uh, nothing to double check. So you, you're sort of left empty. Um, and there's other documents that are um, where you can check a lot of things. Um, you know, like the air accident report of 1947 that uh, I think uh, Hap Arnold uh, signed. It's a three-page one. It's very descriptive of various um, parts of of what what's inside Roswell, uh, the Roswell crash. Um, but you have a cover page for it, and you you can determine. Well, oh yeah, the war bond stamp in the upper corner and the save seal are correct, and the signatures at the bottom from uh, Lawrence Craigie, General Craigie, is is correct and yeah he's the right guy at the right time um the format of an air accident report for 1947 is is accurate for this document so you can do some things like that now you still can't prove the uh the content but the the cover page seems to be uh completely legit but Fundamentally, it goes back. So you're left with the situation of some documents you can investigate a lot, some you can't. Well, and and let's just step back and and look at it. I guess logically, and I'm sure you've discussed this with with other folks, but um, notwithstanding the reality or non-reality of of so-called MJ12, if the country or the world was faced with something like this you would think that something like MJ-12 would almost have to be formed out of necessity simply to deal with it because you you can't have everybody knowing about it all of a sudden. It's going to cause problems. And uh, the Brookings Institute has said as much, and I still am of the opinion that uh, it's not such an easy thing to swallow. Uh, and uh, And I <laughs> was sort of chided a little bit because I told a congressman that he said, can you, can we tell the people? And I immediately said, no, <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> wouldn't you agree that, that, uh, uh, some sort of a, an organization or a committee like this would have had to be formed and you would want the kind of people on that committee that, you know, actually reflected the people who were quote unquote allegedly on MJ twelve. Who were some of the most the most notable figures that you recall being on the original panel? I mean there was um, you know Well I mean the question is what's what's the original panel? Yeah. Um I mean the, the classic MJ twelve people is the Eisenhower briefing document of fifty four, but when you look at some of the leaked majestic documents in nineteen forty seven, it's all like on the white hot report, which is on majesticdocuments.com. Um, you know, you've got Theodore von Karman and Oppenheimer and Einstein, and then you've got uh, on the main committee investigating people, you got Vannevar Bush, and then weird people like Captain Buchanan, and there's a there's a long list of of um more technicians or 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 just uh, support people. Um, that were there doing science and work, as well as the the notable heavyweights that we all recognize today of of Bush and Oppenheimer and Einstein and von Karman. Yeah, and uh, was not James Forrestal on uh, purportedly yeah. on on MJ twelve? Yeah, he and, was uh, yeah. on on the on the front, and the Forrestal story is um, interesting. Um, well. People may remember that he was defenestrated, you know, literally thrown out a window um, or fell out of a window. With bars on it. What Didn't it have bars on it? <laughs> I think so. Uh, and, you know, allegedly the, the act was necessary or regrettable, according to one of the leaked majestic documents. Um, and I, I got um, 
the FBI file for uh, for him and uh, FOIA'd it and got it. And it was his phone was tapped. He was a little bit of an alcoholic. He was a little bit depressed at times. Um, it, it's clear that the powers that be could recognize him as being um, potentially unstable. Um, My understanding comes, was he had threatened to come forward. That, yeah, uh, that's that was the that was the, the fear. He was I guess. no longer reliable. No longer reliable. There you go. And so he was defenestrated, uh, allegedly. So I mean, I think the the color of the FBI files is uh, is interesting and. You know, I have the largest collection of FBI files that I'm aware of. Um, you know, loads aside from of the FBI. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> and so, and many I got a long ago, um, and some are some are heavily redacted, some are not. Um, but you know, given the fact that you're a lawyer, well, let's do a few FOIA lawsuits. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, I, you know, there's tons of material that could be um, litigated. Well, um, it's it's weird that you should bring that up because that's what my talk is going to be about this uh, this summer oh. at this symposium. I'll be talking on the law of secrecy, UFOs, and the need to know. And so, uh, you know, how yeah. how FOIA and all that uh, works fits into you know what I'll be talking about. So, yeah. uh, you know, you understand that area very well. And and uh, understanding that area very well, you know that, you know, they've taken a new approach uh, to these FOIA requests. And it, virtually anything now, no matter how innocuous the information might be, may be denied on the grounds uh, that uh, it could be revealed social, or so national, I was going to say social security, I'm getting close to retirement, national security uh, secrets, or, or that it would, uh, you know, uh, give our enemies uh, an idea about what, which direction to go, uh, even though the information is innocuous, they're still denying those FOIA requests, even though you could look at it, well, so what if they were chewing bubble gum? Yeah, but, you know, uh, they have to chew bubble gum because of certain kind of radiation, and the you see what I'm getting at? Uh, it's a, it's I think the they mosaic. Call it the of, mosaic uh, theory, that's correct. The, the mosaic, mosaic theory. theory. Um, that's correct. Yeah, well, um, you know, I have a, a very specific example. Um, I got the uh, Central Intelligence Group, CIG, um, before the CIA, it was the CIG. The agenda item, <clears throat> agenda memo sent off by um, their admin had um, put four topics on July 17th, 1947 on it. Um, Roswell was early July, three, four, five, something like that. Um, but one is blacked out. And this was blacked out when I got it in 2001. Um, and it's very likely that, I, I don't know if the CIA has uh, inherited all the CIG uh, documentation. It was the National Archives, and the answer is, I don't think so. I think it's still there. Um, but that's an example of they sure should be able to, you know, find the original and um, declassify it, especially now that the uh, HR, where where is it? The uh, the new law yes. for the National Archives is, is passed and they're implementing it where they have to uh, post um all sorts of ufo related material um are you going to cover that in your talk i am going to cover a little bit of that in my talk um, um my as as i said mine uh well I, i'm going to try to familiarize some of the lay people with how the law works around ufo secrecy and and then sort of tie it all together with actual cases uh, where they've used things like the mosaic theory, uh, for example, uh, well, and and also uh, where they've used things like the state secrets privilege, 
uh, to keep, you know, things that might affect national security out of civil court cases be, to be used as evidence. So I, I'm going to I'm going to cover kind of a, a wide variety of things, all related to how the law works and how the government uses the law to to keep us from knowing the truth about this whole area. Yeah. Well, my my experience is that I um, there's all sorts of documents that paint a, a picture of, and I'll probably show a few um, at the MUFON symposium uh, just to get people pumped up and excited. Because in 2003, at the first annual UFO crash retrieval conference, I gave a talk called uh, Evidence from the Archives. And I went through like 15 or 20 juicy pieces of um, of documents that I found that suggest crash saucers and reverse engineering and and all sorts of withdrawal slips, um, you know, from General Twining to General uh, Ramey at precisely the right time and how many pages and it's top secret restrict, restricted data. Uh, so it's when you know where to look or when to look, um, it gets it gets to be a lot of fun. I mean, Grant Cameron is probably one of the best people that has done a lot of great research at, at various uh, presidential libraries about yeah. this exact methodology. And when you sit down and talk to Grant, he he he, he will relay this information to you just nonstop. I mean, he it just it pours out of him. He, he knows so much about the subject that uh, you don't have to ask him any questions. He just he just you know, and he knows where it's going. He just will he'll just and you've talked to him, so you know what I'm talking yeah. about. He he really knows he really knows his stuff. Be, before we go, Ryan, I I, I want to ask you something related to something that you just said, which was. Uh, related to uh, Nathan Twining, uh, and that is the Cutler Twining memo. Can you tell us about that and uh, tell us what the Cutler Twining memo is, and uh, and what are its implications? Yeah. Um, well, the first thing to remember is the Cutler Twining memo came out of the National Archives. It's uh, MJ twelve, a special studies group. Um, Original onion skin. I think that um, uh, Stan Friedman got it, or maybe it was somebody before them, before him. And it's um, it's very interesting. I mean, it's innocuous. It's a it's an administrative memo. What what's interesting is that it says MJ twelve special studies group. Um, uh, I'll add some more coloration to it. Um, for example, Lloyd Berkner's FBI file um, has <clears throat> that he's been assigned to the White House uh, Special Studies Project, um, Paren M, unclosed Paren. So it, it's like there's an M clearance. You've heard of Q clearance? Yes. I think historically there is an M clearance uh, maybe changed or different, but for probably four or five years or maybe 10 or 15 years, there's an M clearance uh. for this topic. Um, so it, and merely, people, it, it merely verifies the, the existence of this study group. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah. And then there's also another document that was in the Joint Intelligence Objectives Agency um, that... Uh, um, came through FOIA, where it says CIA uh, MJ-12 in the lower, that was the carbon copy, uh, CIA MJ-12 um, in in the lower carbon copy. Um, so th there's a couple of documents. I think there's a one, there's, there's another MJ-12 member which has the same FBI file um, uh, details concerning special studies group um, M. So, I mean, it's it's supportive. Is there an MJ-12 that's provable in the court of law? Absolutely, right out of primary sources in the National Archives. 
So, no, so, so, my, so, so my final question would be then, uh, does MJ-12 still exist? Uh, and if so, is it in the same or similar form, or has it uh, mutated into something else? Well, it would, it would have to exist. I mean, the cover-up is still here. If you believe in crash saucers and ETs and so forth, that there has to be a control group. It may, be, it may not be called MJ-12 anymore, but it still exists. And I'm sure it's vastly bigger. It's more compartmentalized, and I think it's um, it's more proprietary uh, and outside the government. More trade secrets, more um, completely away from prying eyes of the government. Um, but there may be some front doors or or, or uh, places to knock on to go from the government to those organizations. Does there have to be for funding and so forth? Ryan, I appreciate you being here with us tonight. I really do. This talk has been very interesting. And I know that your talk this summer at the MUFON Symposium in Dallas is going to be absolutely fantastic. I'm really looking forward to that. I appreciate you joining us tonight. Yeah. Well, thanks, Richard. It's been fun. And uh, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun in Dallas, too. Yeah, I agree. I, I'll be back in a few moments with some afterthoughts. You? are not alone. Thousands of people all over the world have sightings of UFOs per month. MUFON is the place to report them. Since 1969, MUFON has been investigating UFO reports and providing this information to the public. Our aim is the scientific study of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. Support UFO research. Join MUFON today. You are listening to the official podcast of the Mutual UFO Network. Shadowy figures in black suits tossing government officials out of windows. Secret whistleblowers sending film of secret documents to UFO researchers. Secret programs to retrieve and back-engineer alien spacecraft. Piles of documents with tiny clues hidden in the paper they were printed on. The type of machines used to produce them and the secret language they contain that few understand or even recognize. This is the world of Ryan Wood, the world of secrecy, a world which, as ufologists, we all live in to a certain extent. Thank you, Ryan, for your tireless efforts to uncover the truth about UFOs and the links to which our government will go to keep the secret. We all look forward to seeing your presentation at the MUFON Symposium this July in Dallas. Thank you for joining us. And remember to like, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you next time right here on the official MUFON Podcast. <laughs>